Um, but it's a, it's a, a migrant story. Again, it's inspired by the crazy things that we've been seeing on the on the news and in the world. Um, people having to flee war-torn countries um, with the family, absolutely no possessions, and having to take incredible risks um, just to see that the kids have a future, essentially. And it's about um, a young mother, young widowed mother, who decides to leave a war-torn uh, kingdom. And there's a war going on with orcs, where like all my orc-like creatures, my own version of orcs. And um, it's her story of trying to escape and how humanity breaks down as well as like there's monsters inside the world as well as outside the walls, I'd say. Um, so again, that adds a bit of a political leaning and I'm, uh, I've sort of come full circle in, in life because when I first started writing, um, I was quite into politics. Um, but I've, I was big ideas and I got told by many people that I was an idealist and things would never change and stuff like that. And you sort of slip into the sort of the apathetic mindset that they want us to have and that so many of us have. You can't blame people for having it. Um, but sort of last few years of just being like, ah, I just can't stand the world anymore. And it's getting worse, so much worse, and nothing's getting, I mean, I'm going <laughs> in, a, in a worse direction. Um, and I decided then to, because I was thinking so much about it, I just really wanted to write something that I could explore the sort of things that I was frustrated with. Um, but in a sort of, hopefully in a more constructive way. Everybody, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter, another great author on the show. And what I love about doing podcasts, you get to talk to people around the world. And I'm in Canada, so anytime I can talk to somebody who's not in Canada is a big bonus for me. And Richie's here on the podcast. Excited to have him on. If you like anything to do with fantasy as a writer, if as a reader you love fantasy books, you're going to love Richie. He has a podcast as well, which we're going to talk about. And he likes building community around what he's doing. So lots of great stuff to chat about, as well as a new book coming out in March. So excited to have Richie here. Richie, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dave. Delighted it's great. To be now, here. if you hear that accent, I know, Richie, I don't have an <laughs> accent as a Canadian. You can smile at me now. Yes, right. Yeah. I don't have an accent, but you have an amazing accent. I love it. Can you tell everybody where you are in this big world of ours? Yeah, I am in Liverpool in the UK. Uh, mm. it's probably well, most well known for the Beatles but if you're right. a soccer fan probably know Liverpool Football Club as well probably don't know the lesser known football club which is the one I support Everton and <laughs> so uh, yeah that's probably what it's known for yeah there's uh, that famous picture of Abbey Road with the Beatles and you see the four band members walking across the road but I always tell people, if you look at that photo carefully, there's actually five Beatles oh, in yeah? that picture. There's actually a Volkswagen Beetle oh, uh, parked course, on yeah. the side of the road. So there's technically five Beatles in that photo. So on Abbey yeah. Road. So it's quite just, a, <laughs> next time you're looking, go check it out. Check it out. <laughs> it's quite a funny story about Abbey Road. Um, so Abbey Road is not in Liverpool, funny enough. Um, <laughs> and this guy, I was walking along Penny Lane. Funny mm. enough at the oh, time. There you go. And this Singing guy song, yeah. this guy pulled up alongside me and he was like, Oh, what is what is what's so special about Penny Lane? And I was like, It's it's not really, it's just a street and there's like a sign that the Beatles all signed, which you can go and have a look at. And I was like, just pointed that out to him and he's like, So where's that be round? And he was from London himself. And I was like, Nah, not here. <laughs> You're far <laughs> away from Ivy Rose. There you go. Amazing. Um, so yeah, so do you love music, Richie? Are you a music guy? I do love music, yeah. Okay. I um, uh, it took me a while to get into the Beatles, though, funny enough. I think it's because really? you're from Liverpool, everyone goes on about the Beatles, and then you're like, ah, I'm one of them people yeah. if everyone's like flocking one direction, I'll go and see what's happening on the other side, yeah. Um, but I do love music, love classic rock, Allman Brothers. I mean, you're from Ooh. Canada, and Neil Young's one of my favorites. Oh, so yeah. I had his brother, Bob Young, 
On no my way. Podcast. Oh my God. So it was the coolest thing ever because he wrote a book around somebody who plays golf, blah, blah, blah. But I got a chance to talk to Neil's brother. What a great guy. He told me stories about Neil growing up. It was so cool. So there you go. So you never know uh, who you're going to talk to on a podcast. Did you get uh, a word in to try and get Neil on the show? <laughs> I would love, they don't like to do interviews. Those guys do not like it. No. So, um, but unless it was really kind of cool. Unless he's ranting about something. Yeah. So we are the new media, right? We can get access to these amazing people. They don't want to talk to anybody in the news. But you and I come up with a podcast. They're like, sure, I'll talk to you. Yeah. It's awesome. It's so cool. I know. It's very liberating. Right. So on that, you have a podcast. Tell mm -hmm. everybody about your show. How long have you been had? Have, have you had the podcast? It's called the Fantasy Writers Tool Shed. And it's been going for a good few years. I was going to stop good. it. I used to do it with a, a guy called Justin. Um, and we did it for a while together. But he, that's to take, take a step back. We were getting too busy with work and stuff. So I was like, oh, I might leave it. But mm. too many people were listening to it. So I was like, oh, just try it. Carry on. And um, it's been amazing since because... I was like, I can't do this on my own. So I'm gonna, no one can understand this accent for half an hour. So um, <laughs> I had just went out and just looked for guests. And it was quite interesting what you say about how new media sort of breaks down barriers. Because when you start, I mean, I'm someone who suffers tremendously with imposter syndrome. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm approaching like best-selling authors who I admire and look up to and begging that they even look at the email um, but they just come back to you just like perfectly normal people and <laughs> just like yeah I'd be delighted to go on the show and then all of a sudden you you sort of interviewing like these amazing people who you, you respect and admire and it's like best selling authors like international bestsellers like I've had the, the biggest uh the, the fastest selling author and one of the biggest selling authors in India. Um, yeah. And I didn't know anything about him, but he's like the equivalent of like Tolkien, but for India. And wow. um, and a former FBI agent. He was amazing. He's game on. He's like an international expert on body language. Um, and I just try and the whole time while he's talking, are you thinking, is he looking at me? Like, yeah. Is he figuring me out? He's just so perfectly still the whole time. But literally at, <laughs> at the end, as he asked me when the episode was coming out and I scratched the back of my neck and he was like, what's wrong? And I was like, nothing's wrong. Well, what are you asking that for? And he was like, well, you scratched the back of your neck, so that means you're worried about something. I was like, Jesus Christ, Joe, have you a nightmare? Are you a nightmare? <laughs> Fury, I'm scratching the back of my neck now because I feel yeah. like, wow, that's amazing, right? Yeah. yeah, but that was, it's like a superpower. So I thought that would be quite interesting for writers. It's all tied to mm -hmm. writing. So I have historians on talking about medieval history, psychologists talking about characters and sociologists. Um, so yeah, it's, it's brilliant what you can do because you've got, you've, like you say, you've got, you're empowered to do whatever you want. And as long as people yeah. like and appreciate it, then it's all worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I think podcasting can be the most selfish thing you can do. <laughs> like you could just get people on because you want to meet them. If somebody listens, great. Obviously that we want people to listen to our show, but the chance to talk to somebody that I admire simply because I have a show, like I'm going to use that as much as possible. Yeah. I had the original writer on my show from Inspector Gadget. Oh, nice. It was a children's TV show back in the day, a long time ago. And he's the original off writer wrote every episode. I'm like, he came on my show and we just, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this yeah. is so cool to have somebody that I used to watch your show when I was a little kid and now here you are, I get to talk to you. It's crazy. Yeah. Who you can talk to with a podcast. I know. I was like just thinking something along them lines. Like I wonder if I could just manufacture a way just to interview like, the last survivor members of the Alban Brothers. Ooh. <laughs> I was like, why not? Right? Start a podcast about the old ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chase them down. You never know, right? Yeah. It's not going to happen if you don't ask. But I think this ties into um, basically like what where I started writing is 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 crazy. Like we're looking back um, because 
I was terrified to do all of these things that like even just being on a podcast chatting to you now, like say I do suffer from imposter syndrome. It's it's bit in a bit of a box now, but it does get out every now and then. And it's I think a lot of people, a lot of writers especially, like they have this fear um that they can't do it, they're not good enough, they don't want to fail. Um and then this sort of negative voice just sort of talks you into not doing anything and and you just don't try and um podcasting like i i don't know anything about podcasting let's be honest and i know a bit more than what i did when i started out but you just gotta try yeah. these things um yeah. and like even though it's it's podcast and it's audio it's it's the sort of mental discipline that you need to sort of you need to, to write you need to sort of push yourself to take a chance and to to, I don't know, tell stories that you're interested in and without sort of worrying about what other people think and, yeah. and stuff like that. So it all yeah. ties in. So Richie, for somebody who's an author, they're early in their journey to write a book, but they're struggling with that imposter syndrome. Like who's ever going to read my book? Who cares what I have to say? Based yeah. on your experience and kind of how you were working through it yourself, any words of wisdom to somebody who's really scared to put their words on paper and put it out into the world? I think you do just have to take the, the jump. Um, because I, I was I was thinking about this today because I'm doing writing a, a script for a podcast episode that I decided to do on my own <laughs> for Christmas. And it's a summary, basically, of all the best writing tips I've learned in, in 2024. And yes. one of them is basically a reflection on what has become sort of more evidence to me this year than ever before and it's basically that you can't do it on your own you've got to get help from other people and whether it's like help with editing or getting a book cover done or whatever um you need the sort of it's 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 just necessary essentially and it gives you confidence as well especially like working with other writers to improve what you've created and to point out the things that you're not so good at because let's be honest we mm -hmm. need that honest feedback um and as long as you open your mind to the criticisms and the reality that you're not charles dickens then, yeah <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right then you, you you've got nothing to stop you really and i think that is really important when you're starting out you've just got to basically open your heart up to a bit of hate um work with other people as much as you can um mm -hmm. and that's why i created the community because when i started yeah, I out that. there was nothing there was nowhere yeah. you could go you could maybe go on forums you could try reddit i mean some brilliant people on reddit but i mean if you're worried about sharing your, your stuff online then you're not going to go to reddit <laughs> yeah. there was a Great. few facebook groups um before facebook groups went weird and a bit useless um mm. and probably a two years ago now when I set up up um, it was a Facebook group and I just found that it wasn't people weren't able to engage on the human level almost because there's this wall they're commenting on things and it's not like a back and forth as as like a normal conversation would and then I sort of started trying discord um, which is if anyone's unfamiliar with discord it's just like an instant messaging um platform um but you can create communities called servers and then break up them uh communities into like different subjects and stuff like that so i created that stuff you couldn't do on facebook for example um yeah. and then created spaces for like people where people could share uh, requests for beta reading if they've got a story or a chapter they wanted to get feedback on and then Loads of people started joining, and I think it's probably about there's about six hundred people at the moment. Wow. Um, and probably like a year ago, um, the the sort of beta groups evolved into critique groups where people were just like, oh, "We want more feedback. We're getting so much benefit out of this. We need to make it more regular." And you you probably hear like a lot of good teachers on writing talking about how useful writing groups can be i think brandon sanderson he's like a really good fantasy author brilliant teacher of writing as well 
and he's in a weekly writing group and he gets constant feedback from other writers um, and you get that honest sort of brutal insight into how, what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong so that you can fix yeah. it, understand where your weaknesses are and then that's how you really do improve. So them critique groups, I think there's like 11 or 12 now. And hmm. some of them meet, I've, I've met every week, every week for a, over a year, um, four or five people meeting up. And I think that was brilliant because I didn't organize anything there. That just happened organically. That was just people getting together in that environment and saying, this is what we want to do. He was up for it. And then loads of people were interested. People volunteered hmm. to organize it. So it was amazing. Yeah. And it really worked. So it's really worked for them. Loads of them have put books out. Um, some people are getting like short stories published regularly. Um, and they've all, I don't think anyone has turned around and said that the writing hasn't got better. Um, and I think that's what the, the biggest thing, biggest sort of step you can take if you would really want to commit to writing and get better at your craft just deciding to work with other people um yeah. it's a big thing so we have um you are you still accepting new people into your communities like yeah. people can come and join i'll share the link with you and anyone can okay. sign up and we'll join. put it in the notes good yeah because i think that's one thing that a lot of the authors i talk to they do feel like they're on their own they're wrestling with their imposter syndrome they have nobody to talk to. They're trying to stay motivated to write all by themselves. There's nobody in the corner going, hey, Richie, did you write today? There's nobody there for them. And they give up or they delay and it takes forever to write this book. But being in a community, at least there's somebody there kind of going, hey, how are things? Are you good? Can you read my chapter? Because I'd like to get some feedback. I'll read your chapter. That kind of back and forth, I think, helps people to be a little more accountable to their dream of writing their book. Just yeah. knowing there's someone else there that's going, hey, Richie, are you good? Like, are things good? Yeah, good. Okay. Like, just having that, I think, is better than to write on your own and be in your own little world and try to stay motivated. It's really hard to do. Yeah, especially with everything that life's got to throw at you, like your nine to five yeah. and everything else. So, yeah, it's tough. And just having other people who are on the sort of same interests of you as you, um, maybe writing the similar kind of thing. Um, just want to bounce ideas off, talk through things. If you've got a little question, Mag, and yeah. I think they pick you up when you're feeling down. Yeah. So, yeah. Richie, talk to us about your books, too. We have a lot of readers that are, are listening to the podcast. They may or may not ever write their own book, but they're looking to fall in love with an author, and you have a lot to offer with all the amount of books you have out there and short stories and all kinds of great stuff. Talk a little bit about your your world of all the things you're writing, and we're going to talk about something coming up in March, but kind of take us back a little bit into some of the things you've written in the past. Well, how would you describe your books to a new reader so that we know if this is the book for us or not? Yeah, and it's always quite hard, isn't it, And uh, trying to yeah. give yourself a pricey, but uh, I've, I think my writing has definitely changed over the years, hopefully it's got better. <laughs> but um, I think the types of things have always been the same. So I am sort of motivated by um, injustices. I think that's kind of why I was drawn to law. I used to be a lawyer. Um, and then I'm also quite interested in politics as well, quite related. Talk about that in a little bit though. Um, mm. And I think around the time when I when growing up, I absolutely adored fantasy books. Like I, I think I was 11 when the first Lord of the Rings film came out on the cinema. Mm -hmm. Read the Hobbits when I was uh, around the same age and then Harry Potter mania as yeah. well. So I was always living in a sort of different world and went to university and stuff like that. Started reading law books and drinking alcohol. So all the, <laughs> all, all the, the pleasure reading fell away but when I was working as a lawyer I was getting quite down I was like oh, this is this is life now this is me yeah nine to five right. at this desk listening to Susan moan about a compensation so <laughs> um 
Yeah, I was like, ah, oh. and then I, I had a look at it. Was quite lucky actually because I had a boss who was really into fantasy books, like way more than I was. Like he knew all of these fantasy books that I've never read of, and he put me on to like Raymond Feist, uh, James Barclay. Uh, I just got the spark back. Absolutely loved it. I was blown away by these books, and um, I was going for, obviously going through quite a a tough time myself as well. Um, just working out what the hell life was about and stuff. And I got so much satisfaction out of these books and the escapism that they provided me. I was like, this is like an amazing thing that they've given me. And I kind of want to do the same. Hmm. Uh, I've always enjoyed writing and stuff like that. So, um, gave it a go and fell in love. So I tended to always write fantasy because that's what, that was the first love. It's my childhood, yeah. childhood crush. <laughs> so is there is there a starting point for a new reader for your books? Where should they should they go back to book one? Where should they, where should they start as a new reader? So I started out writing a lot of short stories and if any writers uh, listening, I always recommend when you start you know, getting, practicing your craft and sharpening your skills, short stories are a great place to start because yeah. nice quick projects and there's a lot you can do with short stories. So I, I've got a couple of short story collections one's about fantasy one's more literary um because that's what I'd, I'd write any story that pops into my head and it tends to write say about 60 70 percent of fantasy but then i just call it literary because it's always got that literary flair but it all sort of mix genres like magical realism historical fiction um horror um and stuff like that so i just finished the story um which is a bit like, I mean, it's inspired by the life of Pi, but it's about Gaza and all the horrific things going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just like, if there's something that sort of motivates me in, in a way, I'll write it. Um, but I've got a novel as well, which is a fantasy novel. Um, that isn't uh, set in the world that I've created. Uh, I call it Tavia, and that's where all of my fantasy stories take place. But this novel is not set there. It's uh, it was done for a publisher. Um, it was almost like a commission. Um, yeah. And I liked the idea of the project because it was a shared universe, so shared world. So lots of different authors all uh, create their own stories, but they all interlink and take place wow. within that sort of world. So I, I liked the idea. I thought it was really cool. Uh, I applied. Um, and and wrote the the novel and that was that. But it's a good story if you like underdog stories and it's fantasy, loads of big action scenes and um characters uh doing what the world doesn't expect them to do. Um mm -hmm. and since then I've just been working on another fantasy novel which is set in my world of Terrier. And this is just sort of classic fantasy novel. Uh good versus evil like what is evil what is good um and sort of exploring that through the characters in a fantasy story essentially mm -hmm. um but it's a, it's a, a migrant story again it's inspired by the crazy things that we've been seeing on the on the news and in the world um people having to flee war-torn countries mm -hmm. um with the family absolutely no possessions and having to take incredible risks um, just to see that the kids have a future, essentially. And it's about um, a young mother, young widowed mother, who decides to leave a war-torn uh, kingdom. And um, there's a war going on with orcs, where, like, all my orc-like creatures, my own version of orcs. And um, mm. it's her story of trying to escape and how humanity breaks down as well as like the monsters inside the world as well as outside the walls i'd say um so again that adds a bit of a political leaning and I'm, uh, i've sort of come full circle in in life because when i first started writing um uh, i was quite into politics um but i've i was big ideas and i got told by many people that I was an idealist and things would never change and stuff like that. And you sort of slip into the sort of the apathetic mindset that they want us to have and 
that so many of us have. You can't blame mm-hmm. people for having that. Um, but sort of last few years, I've just been like, ah, I just can't stand the world anymore. And it's getting worse, so much worse, and nothing's getting, I mean, I'm going <laughs> in, a, in a worse direction. Um, and I decided then to, because I was thinking so much about it, I really wanted to write something that I could explore the sort of things that I was frustrated with. Um, but in a sort of, hopefully in a more constructive way. Um, but it is essentially a story about a, a revolution against the corrupt capitalist governments just in a fantasy mm. world. Yeah. So that comes out in Something March. that I think no matter where you live, wherever country you're in, you're going to have a similar struggle with what's going on politically and where you live. I think there's a lot of people who could resonate with that and go, oh, I know what you're talking about, Richard. <laughs> Richie, I love, I love having a book like this to take me away and make me think of things in a different way. So I like that you're writing about stuff like this. This is good. Yeah. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I just feel really helpless a lot of the yeah. time. Like we are yeah. literally trapped in this bloody system. Like what can we do to get out of it? We can't really, unless you go off the grid, which let's be honest, is not a really re- a, re- a, a choice for many of us. Mm. Um, but uh, I wanted to create a story basically that was like, right, we don't have to accept it. Um, this is a story about fighting against it and showing people, reminding people that all the power is in you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you've got the ability to shape the world around you and the world as you want it to be. And the, the people in power, they think the same and they're just doing it. <laughs> we're, we're not. So yeah. but there's more of us than them. So, so that's the complete opposite Richie, of your struggle with your imposter syndrome. You -hmm. just said you have the power in you to make change. You can do something in your world. But as an imposter, feel like you feel like an imposter, you just feel so held back that you don't feel like you have the power in you, that you don't have a voice. Nobody cares. You can't make a difference. Like it's the complete opposite of what you're writing about. So is this kind of how you're dealing with your own internal struggle to find your place? Yeah, I think it, it certainly is. Um, and it's it's sort of that struggle. It's it's like a, I think it echoes what a lot of people face. It's like some days that imposter syndrome speak louder than the sort of defiant voice that we all want. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's a, I don't know. I think it's, it's important to feel a bit of imposter syndrome from time to time, just to keep you grounded. Mm-hmm. I think there's like, I was speaking to Jennifer Armentrout on the podcast and she's an international bestseller. And I just asked her, do you ever get imposter syndrome? She's like, all the time, all yeah. the time. Um, yeah. And I always wonder why so many authors experience it and what, I mean, this is the reason what I put it down to is, is my sort of background and upbringing and coming from more of a working class background where you're told you can't do things or you're not good enough to do things. Um, which was the same as her. Like she, she like didn't have enough money to buy books growing up. So they'd have to go to the library and or the kids would laugh mm-hmm. at them and stuff like that. So it does have, it does shape kinds of things that matter to you in life um and influences what you're interested in i think down the line and i kind of feel everything's come full circle back to sort of this sort of sense of injustice again um and it's getting he said it's getting so much worse and i just needed a way to vent to process um and hopefully enable other people to do the same um, and one of the inspirations for the sort of approach I took with this book, um, was a lot of classic philosophy. Um, I, I don't know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of philosophy or like contemporary philosophy around anymore. Um, and we do tend to drift back towards the sort of classics, um, Plato and Socrates and all of them. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I did come across Epicurus. And what I liked about Epicurus is that he focused on what it means to be happy and not what it means to be good. And everyone scorned him for that. But he was probably mm -hmm. the most successful philosophers of them all. He had hundreds of thousands of followers in the Mediterranean. People lived in communes inspired by his teachings. Um, and it's, it's the sort of early influence of, of Marxism, I suppose, because his idea was about community and egalitarianism and, and just living a happy sort of life, not sort of driven by, um, material needs and wants and desires and stuff like that. And, and to focus on friendships and because they're the things that truly make us happy and, mm -hmm. and satisfied and stuff like that. And, um, the way they sort of discuss these things is through what they call dialogues, which is just conversations basically with a few different people, but it's like written like a story. And I really loved that sort of idea of characters having conversations, um, about sort of the topics that sort of matter to me like capitalism and the way things are structured, why things are unfair, the impact they have on uh, the wide on wider society. And uh, I sort of decided to take that and put it in, like try and mix it with a bit of a fantasy story in the middle of a revolution. Um, hmm. And it's quite a fast paced story. So it, the revolution takes place over the course of a day and um, I was keen to showcase like so many different perspectives. I don't know if you've ever seen The Wire. Yeah. 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 That's, you love that show. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, one of the reasons I love it is because it, it looks at the issue of the war on drugs from lots of different perspectives and shows the impact it's had. And that way you get a more complete picture. And that's what I wanted to do here. I wanted to show the impact of this sort of corrupt capitalist system and the impact it's had on everybody in society. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's good. You've got like the obviously working class people, um, drug dealers, they give mm. the economic perspective in the story as I think mm. there's the sort of ugly face of capitalism. Uh, yeah. uh, and then we've got the kids, you know, the victims essentially police what it's like to enforce these corrupt laws and stuff like that and then the sort mm -hmm. of older people in society and it's it's uh i think that's the the best way to, to uh, sort of tackle the subject i think um yeah using different perspectives and then each sort of character uh takes the story to a certain point and then it, it passes on to the next character yeah so it's eight parts and uh, it's only short book, so if you have got a short attention span, then <laughs> you won't be you won't be reading it for too long. Do you find Richie that your legal background comes into your writing at all? Do you kind of see elements of that as you write your book? Um, I have got a few characters. Um, I'm not in this story, but um, <laughs> saying that it is the second chapter in the story. It's quite heavily influenced by my legal background because I've got mm. a trade union working class character, the train u trade union man. So he's like a, uh, a steward, well, I think that's what they call them. Um, and he's sort of fighting against like a ruthless employer who's trying to remove all kinds of working rights. Um, yeah. and then he's trying to sort of fight that and also please or keep the union on board essentially um but he gets uh enlisted to help in the revolution and to basically spark the workers into protest and then that's the the uh the sort of the flame that hits the kindling then to spark the revolution mm. um but yeah it's quite interesting because uh, I, there's a, a nasty accident at work or a fatal accident at work and um, that happens in that. And that's what I used to do. I used to do accidents at work claims. <laughs> mm, yeah. So that was, that was one way, but I do think the sort of injustice 
Like I, I really hate people being wronged and done over. Um, yeah. Liverpool as a city uh, has kind of faced a lot of injustices over the years, especially in recent times from the governments and um, conservative governments, yeah. Margaret Thatcher and all. So yeah. um, that's sort of been inbred in you as well. I, and also I'm Irish, so <laughs> so the uh, the injustice runs deep. There you go. Yeah, I just think with all that legal knowledge and background and study, that's a piece of you. I don't think you can just shut that off like a light. That's a piece of you that I think would filter into your writing to some degree. Because to get to the part where you can be a lawyer, you have a long journey that many people can't, would never take. They could never do what you do, you've done. So I just imagine some of that's going to filter its way somehow into how you write and into your characters over time. Yeah. And I also used to run an Irish pub, so that's definitely filtered through to some characters. Some interesting stories behind the behind the bar for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um so the new book that's coming out in March, can you tell us more about what we can look forward to, Richie? What's coming? Yeah, so it's called Together We Rise. Um it's uh like I say, it's about this revolution. Um if you like a sort of grittier style that's probably what this is a is gonna be there's like a swear <laughs> um <laughs> there's quite a lot of not a lot of violence but i don't like pull any punches with the descriptions i don't go mm -hmm. over the top you know what i mean but i don't pull any punches um yeah. and like all these characters are, 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 are people who have been thought over in some way or another um and so if you feel like it's been wronged in some way. You might be able to relate. There's a lot of different characters, a lot of different backgrounds, um, but they all share one thing in common. And um, the the main sort of story is is sort of built around a, a single character, and she's called Talia. Um, and after I sort of finished the novel that I'd, I've mentioned before. Um, she was what was left of another novel that I gutted to use as content for that novel. And she was the best part of it. She was the best part of mm. the story. And what she, her story essentially is, um, she's the daughter of a blacksmith. Um, but in a roundabout way, she gets sort of swooned by this guy who's the captain of a, um, the, the local police in the city. And, um, it turns out he's a horrible bastard. <laughs> so she ends up marrying him and, uh, he kills her father. She discovers, um, and then he starts abusing her, raping her and stuff like that. Um, and she just sort of falls into like a black hole of despair. Um, and then in a roundabout way, she becomes a vigilante. She sort of comes across a, a woman being raped by another police officer and um, it triggers her and she kills this police officer and feels amazing. She feels alive. Hmm. She feels like she's powerful again. She's got control. All of the things that were taken away from her for so long. And she becomes a sort of vigilante. If you, <laughs> and then she starts going around killing corrupt police officers and um, and like drug dealers and stuff like that and starts like a bit of a gang and develops a reputation as a shadow. That's what everyone calls her. Mm. Um, but she realizes it's not enough like to change the world. You can't just go around killing everyone. There needs yeah. to be like a fundamental shift and she starts planning a revolution. Um, and the story is just the the day of the revolution so that is all backstory what i've mentioned you, you find yeah. that out in the story but um it's it starts on the morning of the revolution and i just sort of i don't want to tell you everything that's going to happen i'm just going to reveal it in bit by bit and you'll see it through the character's eyes as, it, as it's all unfolding um and that's what i like to do i like to sort of throw you in intrigue you um lots of action um, and yeah, and it all comes back to Talia, 
but the it doesn't sound like a fantasy story <laughs> because <laughs> it's uh, it is just set in a secondary world. I guess I this world of Tavia that I created, but the last chapter, um, it sort of brings it all back around in a, a big fantastical way. Mm. Um, so mentioned that uh, I like to explore what good and evil is. Um, I do have my sort of own, own theory that I use to sort of build everything around, and basically that there's it sent two forces, good and evil, and the. Uh, they're just this evils hunting down um, any sort of good, and the sort of what I I sort of see these things as is evil is nothingness. It's basically the antithesis to life. It's just not just empty uh, hmm. void, and uh, good is life essentially because <laughs> well, that's the opposite of nothing. So, um, and it's just like an endless battle. And the battle is waged in every living thing, um, encouraging things to do bad things and encouraging things to do good things. And that's the kind of struggle that I explore on a more sort of character-based level. Um, and we've got uh, forces, uh, a force of good and a force of evil who represent these two sides and they're sort of fighting an invisible war. Um, and sometimes that war spills into the sort of the sort of the reality here is because what has happened in in this particular case is one of the forces of evil and they're called it the Kyra and they're a bit like slender men so that's why I had to describe them um they've infiltrated uh the leadership of this city and have turned it into a dictatorship and have slowly corrupted it into this horrible mess and in this last chapter you realize what's been going on and uh you, what is actually happening on a grander grander scale this sort of battle between the forces of life and the forces of nothingness um mm. and then that's a bit of a hook then to the wider fantasy world and uh things to come I'll be explaining Amazing. that really badly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's lots. That's going to help us as a reader to know, oh, this is the right book for me. This is the right book for my friends. I know what they love to read. So hearing it from the voice of the author, I think is always really fun as a reader. Because now when we pick up your book, Richie, we're going to be, we're going to be so excited to see what you have for us as we follow these characters through their stories. I love it. Take us to your website, Richie. Where do we go to follow up we're going to follow and wait for the book in march but to get all of your short stories i'm on your website it's beautiful by the way short oh, stories the link for your podcast is there you've got writing tips for people and tools all kinds of great stuff and your community where do we go for your website where do we where do we have to go yeah just go to richiebilling.com it's uh, b-i-l-l-i-n-g and richie doesn't have a t which some people yep. like to throw a t in i don't know where that came from but people <laughs> just throw t in <laughs> there you go yeah. Awesome. Um, Richie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, congratulations in advance for your new book in March. We're recording this in December, but March is going to be right, right around the corner. So I'm excited for you. And one thing I love for those that are listening in audio, you don't get to see what I get to see, but Richie has this big smile when he talks about his book and he talks about his characters. And you can tell that Richie's really excited about this book coming out. And he's, you can tell, I can see that you're proud of what you've done. So in that sense of being proud of your work, Richie, I hope that fights a little bit against any form of imposter syndrome because you've done something that many people would love to do. Not only written one book, many books, you help authors, you have a podcast, you have a community. So you just keep pouring into people and I'm sure good things are coming to you in the future just by doing that. And again, you got away from the desk job and Susan complaining about her, her wages. Now you're doing something you'd much rather do, share stories and write, write about your characters. I can see it in your face that this really lights you up. So I love when somebody finds their path. And uh, we're not going to make a million dollars maybe by doing it, but we're doing something we love. So it's great, Richie. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much, Dave. That's very kind of you to say. 
And I forgot to have one more writing tip. This Please. is one that I learned uh, recently cool from then. Ian Rankin, and it ties in perfectly what you, you just said just then, and it's sort of right what interests you. Mm. Don't worry about what's selling, what, what, winning all the awards, just write what interests you. There you go. There, there you go. go. And don't be, don't be shy to share your story. The only person who can write your book is you. The only one who could podcast is you. The only one who's lived your life is you. So no one else can do what you do. So Richie, to that end, thank you for doing what you do for your readers. It's great. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to you as well. Thanks for checking out Living the Next Chapter. Happy to have you here. And here at the end, I want to just put this shout out to authors listening. If you want to sell more books, if you want to build community, one of the best ways you can do that is by guesting on podcasts and or having your own podcast. So I have a podcast called The How to Podcast Series, and I help people start podcasts. I also do editing. I also help with social media, website design. I do all those things in addition to being the host of this podcast and the six other podcasts that I do, including How to Podcast Series. I think you would be the perfect person to start a podcast. I would love to help you. Head over to howtopodcast.ca, howtopodcast.ca. Reach out, let me know if you're interested in starting a podcast, and I want to work with you. Thanks for listening to Living the Next Chapter. Catch you on the next one. Take care.